As we explained in the previous video, we can use HDR composition to compose a linear HDR image that emulates the image we would get with a camera with an infinite dynamic range. In this video, we're going to compose the same HDR image using one image with an exposure time of 60 seconds and one with an exposure time of 600 seconds. Remember, this 60 second image has already had the color calibration applied. Once the composition is finished, the tool opens the mask, which is here on the left, and the composite image, which is on the right. Now we can continue with the nonlinear processing, as we said at the end of the last video. Before we stretch the image, we need to check the sky background. This is because the color balance of the composition is based on the image with the shortest exposure, and the longer exposure images adapt to it. This adaptation is actually a scaling effect in each color channel. However, HDR composition doesn't do any color calibration processes. So when it scales the color channels of the longer exposure images, the sky background may not be neutralized. This means that in many cases we'll have to neutralize it ourselves after doing the HDR composition. To do this, we open Background Neutralization and select an area of the sky background. Obviously, in this image, there is no sky background, so the best thing to do is select one of the darkest areas. We'll use this preview as the region of interest and apply the process. As you can see, there was a slight deviation towards the blue in the sky background. Remember, the image is in a linear state, so now we have to stretch it. We open Histogram Transformation and turn on Track View. This histogram looks empty, but actually there's a very narrow peak on the left because this image has an extremely high dynamic range. What we need to do is set the saturated pixels in the white because this image does not saturate at 1. If we hover over the saturated areas, we can see that the value in the red is between 0.41 and 0.42. If we set the highlights clipping point to 0.41, we'll clip 2000 pixels, but those pixels are actually saturated. If we apply the process, the stars turn white. Now we have to delinearize the image. Let's open the real-time preview so that we can see how much we have to delinearize. Normally, when we adjust the midtones of these images, we have to zoom in quite a lot because the midtones value is very small. And we need to zoom in even further to adjust the shadows clipping point. This looks like a good balance for this image because we can see the darkest areas clearly without increasing the noise level too much. The midtone values is about 0.001. Now that we've stretched the image, we have to tackle a problem we often get with deep sky objects, namely that to see the darkest areas, we have to saturate the brightest ones with light. This image therefore needs what we call a dynamic range compression. PixInsight does this dynamic range compression using multi-scale processing algorithms. There are two main tools that use these techniques, multi-scale linear transform and multi-scale median transform. What these algorithms do is divide the image into multiple components, each containing structures of a certain size. Let's create a few previews so that we can see how it works. If we select the 2 pixel scale and change this setting here, we can have a look at the contents of that scale. What we're doing is isolating the structures that are 2 pixels in size. These structures are mainly the weakest stars, the smallest ones in the delinearized image, as well as the background noise, and the finest details of the nebula. They are still very small details, but they are still visible. Let's look at the 8-pixel layer, 
now we start to see more structures in the nebula and some of the brightest stars. Let's compare this layer with a two-pixel layer. Here, the brightest stars are the weakest ones, and here the larger stars start to look brighter. Let's look at the 32-pixel layer. Now we have the brightest stars in the image, like this one or this one. This one is starting to appear now, but it was practically invisible in the previous two layers. And this star is clearly visible in the 128-pixel layer. These algorithms enable us to work on each of these components separately. For example, here we could tackle the noise or increase the contrast of the small structures of the nebula. And here we could add volume to all of these structures. Because multiscale algorithms create all the components, we can work on them separately and then recombine them later to create the processed image. If we look at the center of the nebula, we can see that the traditional algorithms lose all the contrast. Although the contrast is preserved in the less bright areas, these algorithms separate by size but aren't able to recover the contrast we've lost in the center of the nebula. This is where PixInsight's Dynamic Range Compression Tool adds its magic touch. If we look at how this tool sees the structures, you'll see that it can get right into the heart of the nebula. With this tool, we can recover all the contrast, even in the center of the Orion Nebula. It doesn't matter how high the image's dynamic range is, we'll always be able to recover the contrast at the local level. The tool that enables us to control the dynamic range of the sky objects we photograph is called HDR Multiscale Transform. We can find HDR Multiscale Transform, or HDRMT, in Favorites or in the Multiscale Processing category. The most important parameter in HDRMT is the number of layers we're going to work with. This number defines how many multiscale layers we're going to use when we apply the contrast optimization operation we just defined. If we change the number of layers and try it out on a few previews, we'll very quickly see how it works. If we use just a few layers, only the smaller scale structures are accentuated. As we increase the number of layers, we gradually start to enhance structures of a larger scale in the object's dynamic range. It's the photographer's job to strike the right balance in the way in which the object is represented. As we enhance the larger scale objects, we start to lose some of the smaller, less bright details. However, if we use just a few scales, we get a very unnatural version of the image. Another parameter that is very important is the lightness mask setting. Dynamic range issues are always in the lightest areas, so HDRMT gives us the option to generate a lightness mask on the fly. This means that the technique is only applied where it's needed, and the result is less aggressive. Let's try it with seven layers, for example. We'll apply the process to this preview with seven layers, but with the lightness mask. We don't really need to adjust the contrast in the shadows, only in the areas that are almost saturated. This is without the lightness mask and with the lightness mask. As with any multiscale algorithm, HDRMT tends to cause ringing. The rings are usually quite large and diffuse. For example, if we look at these dark clouds, we can see that the lightness mask helps us to control the ringing in the areas that are too dark. If we decrease the number of layers to six, the ringing moves to this smaller structure near the nucleus. The lightness mask can also help us to control ringing around the bright stars. 
This is particularly noticeable in the photographs that have bright stars on a sky background without any large objects. Here, if we push the image to its limit and apply only four layers, we get ringing around the brightest stars on top of the nebula. We can see this more clearly if we apply the same four layers with a lightness mask to this preview and compare the two. This improves the ringing around the bright stars. With these two options, we can control the dynamic range of almost any object very effectively.